Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out on our first brisk morning of the semester. Um, we're so glad you're here. Let me pray for the message. God, thank you for this morning, and uh, God, thank you for the sunshine and the fall weather. God, we we give you this time. God, we invite your presence here. Help us to be in tune with you. We know you're you're everywhere, God. But help us um, know that you're here. Help us know you better. God, I pray you would communicate through me this morning, and uh, we lift this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thomas, you could turn that down quite a bit, I think. Um, This morning, we're continuing our identity series. Uh, The first week, we talked about our identity in God and uh, the joy and peace and hope about putting our identity in God. And um, then we turned our attention to this God of the Bible, to God himself. And last week, Nathan talked about God the Father, his identity. And today we're going to look at the identity of God the Spirit, otherwise known as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And uh, this is a really broad topic. Um, So I asked God what was most important for this group at this time to learn about the Holy Spirit. And this is where he led. Um, We're going to learn about the Holy Spirit by by studying um, how he interacts with us. We're going to see his identity through that. So the Spirit's identity can be revealed in how he interacts with us. The Spirit's identity can be revealed in how he interacts with us. So we're going to uh, look at different qualities of the Holy Spirit that affect who we are. We're going to look at five qualities. Five qualities of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the first one uh, is that he's, he's relational. First one is he's relational. And uh, let me pause there a moment. Say there's a a dozen different directions. I I could have gone with this message and I thought about doing something very um, experiential. Um, But our next few weeks on Tuesday nights, we're kind of focusing on really getting a deep connection with God um, and and experience. And so I thought this morning we're going to study uh, who who the Spirit is based on Scripture. So, number one is He's relational. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a He, not an It. Um, and He's not some impersonal power like the Star Wars Force. He, he's, he's very personal. He's an equal member of the Trinity. And, and we, we could spend a whole morning on the topic of the Trinity. Uh, let me just give you a little basic about the Trinity. Because... If you're new to church, what's the Trinity? Even if you're a long-term Christian, that idea of the Trinity can be kind of confusing still. So the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Uh, but here's what it is. Trinity describes the biblical concept that we follow one God who exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Trinity describes the biblical concept that we follow one God who exists in three persons. And there are many hints about the Trinity in the Old Testament. The Old Testament never comes and, and spells it out as clearly as the New Testament, but there's over a hundred references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There's references to the Messiah and God as a Father. Um, but it's, the idea of the Trinity is much more revealed in the New Testament, especially at Jesus' baptism and the Great Commission. So, take a look at those. If you want to look in your Bible, if you got that on your phone or uh, a print Bible, if you want to borrow one, there's a bunch along the aisle that you can grab. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can keep one of those. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. That's where we're going to start. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, uh, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. 
So at Jesus' baptism, we see all three members of the Trinity present at the same time. All three of them physically manifested themselves to the crowd there. Uh, so, so one thing we can learn about the Trinity is God doesn't morph from the Father sometimes, and sometimes he's Jesus, and sometimes he's the Holy Spirit. He's all three of them all the time. So we've got Jesus in human form standing in the water. We've got odd, God's audible voice booming from heaven. And then we've got the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that came and landed on Jesus. So all three of them were physically present to that crowd who watched Jesus' baptism, which is pretty awesome. That would have been awesome to, to be there. Um, the other passage is Great Commission. We'll, we'll look at um, part of that. Matthew 28, 19. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice that Jesus puts them all on a level playing field. They're all equally God. They all have the same authority. And so the Holy Spirit uh, is a person of the Trinity. Uh, and he's not only a person, he's personal. Uh, for those of us with a relationship with God, uh, born-again Christians, as, as the Bible defines that, uh, the Holy Spirit relates to us in these ways. And uh, I'm just going to give you a list because we've got a lot to, to understand this morning. He relates to us in these ways. Comfort. In Acts 9.31. Uh, in love. Romans 15.30 is an example of that. Fellowship, uh, participation, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 14, Philippians 2, 1, examples, joy, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. Those are all emotional ways that the Holy Spirit relates with us. Comfort, love, fellowship, and joy. Um, but those aren't the only emotions that he experiences and feelings that he experiences uh, when we deliberately sin, like we go into it knowing that it's wrong. Uh, this is what the Holy, this is what happens with the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's grieved. Ephesians 4:30 and Isaiah 63:10 talk about that. He, he's lied to. Uh, Acts 5:3. He's tested. Acts 5:9. Uh, he's outraged and insulted when, when we deliberately sin against him. Uh, Hebrews 10. 26 through 29 talks about that. So, so uh, be very careful when you refer to the Holy Spirit that you don't call him an it or make him sound like the force or anything like that because he is a person. He is very personal and relational. Uh, and when we feel connected with God, that's the Holy Spirit relating to us and revealing his presence to us. All right, so the second quality of the Spirit Number two is he's assuring. He's assuring. There's so many questions in this world that we would love to have assurance about. Um, you, know, you interview for a job, and, and someone there might think, oh, you'll, you'll get in, no problem. That's nice, but it's nice to have the assurance of that phone call or that letter saying that you officially got the job. Uh, you, know, you may know that your family loves you, um, but it's nice to have the assurance of actually hearing those words. Um, you, you may feel like you bombed the test, uh, and so when the grades are posted, it's nice to have the assurance that you passed it. And whatever the situation, we like to be assured about things. And, and part of the Spirit's role in the Trinity is He's the one who gives us assurance about spiritual things. John 15, 26 says, But when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So depending on the translation you look at for that verse, um, John 15, 26, the verse might say the Spirit is our helper, our counselor, or our advocate. Uh, so basically the Holy Spirit is our defense eternity against fears and doubts. But that's part of his identity and his how he relates to us. He's our defense attorney, a defense attorney against fears and doubts. Um, and he goes on the witness stand, uh, and here's some of the things that he assures us of. 
He testifies to Jesus' identity. John 15, 26 talks about that. He assures us of when we're doing right or wrong, uh, clearing our conscience or sending us guilt so that we'll correct something. Uh, Romans 9, 1 or John 16, 7 and 8. He confirms the gospel uh, through spiritual gifts and miracles. Uh, Hebrews 2, verses 2 through 4. Uh, his, his indwelling presence is a deposit guaranteeing our salvation and our eternity, our getting to go to heaven and, and just the hope of what that's going to be like. The Spirit is a deposit that guarantees that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.30. And uh, he intercedes for us when we're weak and speechless. When we're at the bottom of the barrel... And we don't even know how to approach God. He's still interceding for us. So he assures us we can always come before God. Romans 8, uh, 26 and 27. And none of these is a false assurance or an empty hope. Uh, the Spirit of God always lines up with God's Word. He's, he's the, also known as the Spirit of Truth. He's got our back so we can move forward in confidence about spiritual matters. Uh, the third quality of the Spirit, He is transforming. He is transforming. Uh, last week, Nate talked about uh, the four letters of the name Yahweh uh, being the Tetragrammaton. So, so that sounds like a transformer. Um, and uh, the Holy Spirit is a transformer in that He transforms us. He transforms us. And it would be cool if, you know, when you become a Christian, you could turn into a Camaro or a semi-truck or some other vehicle. That, that'd be cool. Uh, but even cooler uh, and much more practical is that uh, the Spirit starts transforming our hearts uh, and who we are. Uh, without knowing God, uh, most people, all people, tend uh, to go after the world in selfish things that go against God's will, God's law. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 11, or 9 through 11. That's a good chunk there. You can follow along. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. It says, Don't you know? Excuse me. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. Near, no sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So the Holy Spirit transforms us from sinners into saints. The Holy Spirit transforms us from sinners into saints, which is way better than a Camaro. Uh, it says we were washed. Uh, that is referring to our baptism, uh, where God washes away our sins through faith. Acts 22, 16 talks about that. It says we were justified um, when we go from 100, we, we go from 0% forgiven to 100% forgiven instantly. It's when we're justified. We're, we're freed from the guilt. We're freed from the charges. And it says we're sanctified. And, and that means that process of transformation has started. Uh, the Spirit works with us and in us and through us over time to help us line up our lives with what is good and holy. That's that process called sanctification. Uh, and it's not a constricting, limiting <coughs> process. It's a very freeing process. 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 17 and 18 says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So when we cooperate 
with the Holy Spirit in, in this transformation process, um, our lives will start to look more and more like the fruit of the Spirit, which many people are familiar with. Uh, Galatians 5, 20-23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, and that's not like fruits, apples, oranges, bananas, it's like the harvest, the, the yield of the Spirit, uh, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. As we line up with the Holy Spirit, our lives will look more and more like that. The Holy Spirit's fourth quality is that he is inspiring. He's inspiring. Now, as an artist, I can say um, a sunset's inspiring. You might see a beautiful sunset, and if you have any artistic skills, you might um, draw or paint something that resembles that, or you might write a song based on the beautiful colors or, or whatever. You could say that sunset inspires you. Uh, but the Holy Spirit inspires in a, a much different way. Uh, he inspires divinely and supernaturally. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives divine inspiration. He gives divine inspiration. Acts 3 2 says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So they're, they're worshiping, they're fasting. The Spirit said, Set apart these two for the work I've called them to do. Um, it, that wasn't an idea that they came up with themselves. It's not an idea that well, they heard this idea and then someone added to it and someone else added to it, kind of a brainstorm effect. Um, this was pure divine inspiration. Uh, they were seeking God, and God's Spirit answered them clearly and distinctly, directly. Uh, Acts 2.17 says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will see, will dream dreams. So in that passage, Peter was quoting uh, from the book of Joel, and he was not saying that this was something that was going to happen just before Jesus comes back. You know, it doesn't happen, but right before Jesus comes back, this is going to happen. That's not what he was saying. Um, he, he was saying uh, in the context uh, that that prophecy that he quoted was fulfilled that day when he was speaking. Um, God's Spirit will give prophecy, visions, dreams, and, and according to Peter, the last days started on the day of Pentecost, and we're still in them today. Uh, so some people, sometimes people get audible inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes people get a really vivid visual inspiration from the Holy Spirit. And I would absolutely love to experience either of those, but that, that's not how he inspires me, it's not how he speaks to me. And just because you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit in those ways doesn't mean he's not speaking to you. Uh, for me, it, it's more of a subtle but unmistakable leading. Romans 8.14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Uh, for me, God leads by thoughts. Um, hey, it's not a Morgan Freeman type voice that I hear. It, it's not some technicolor vision um, it's just thoughts but I can tell when they're from God uh, sometimes they come after like the one verse we read after I've been intentionally worshiping and seeking God about something uh, maybe I've been brainstorming for an idea to apply in the church and it's just not coming slow going and after seeking God all of a sudden boom that is, the idea is there in its completion and I just know it, it's from God. Um, this is what we're going to do. Uh, sometimes it's just a random God idea that completely came out of nowhere. Uh, thoughts like, go talk to that stranger. Or give that person money. Or ask them this question in, in conversation. Or, or go offer your help. And uh, for certain people, based on your wiring, Certain of those things might be absolutely natural for you. Um, a lot of those aren't natural for me. 
and, uh, and in fact, I usually try to resist that a little bit when thought first comes to my head. Uh, let me share an, an example um, from when Heather and I were newlyweds. Uh, I was, we were living in Mount Pleasant. I was working in Midland and commuting back and forth. And um, I was coming back home after work and um, just, just past downtown Midland, going out towards Mount Pleasant. And I see a hitchhiker. And he's kind of uh, scruffy looking, kind of long, longer hair that was messy. He had on sweat shorts. He was carrying his shirt because it was a hot, very hot summer day. And um, never pick up strangers. I had zero intention of slowing down. And this idea popped into my head to pick him up. Now I'm on my way home. I'm just going to keep going. Idea pops back, pick him up. Well, you know, there's this divided barrier here on the road there. I have to go way out of my way now to circle back around and pick him up. And uh, he'll sweat all over my truck. It's or just whatever excuses I could come up with. And uh, <coughs> the thought came back, pick him up and witness to him. Okay, so like three quarters of a mile past the guy, find a place to turn around, go back past the barrier, turn around, come back, and I stopped and pick him up. And uh, found out that he was going almost all the way to Mount Pleasant, which is where I was going. And uh, so I started praying in my head, okay, God, he's here, now what should I say? What, what do you want me to do? And he says, uh, he turns to me and says, I suppose you're going to tell me God told you to pick me up. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you ask that? And he says, well, a few days ago, I was hitchhiking, and this little old lady stopped and picked me up. And, <coughs> and I, when she pulled over, I said, you shouldn't pull over for me with the way I look. I could be dangerous. And she said, oh, you're not dangerous. God told me to pick you up. <laughs> so, so I had like this... 40 minute captive audience with this guy and God totally opened the door so I was able to talk with him about God. Um, and God especially loves to speak to us when it comes to outreach and sharing the gospel. He, and he might speak to us in different ways but he loves it when it's connected with outreach. Acts 18 um, we're going to look at verses 29 through 31, and then down to verse 35. Acts 18, 29 through 31, and verse 35. It says, The Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading from Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? <coughs> How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. In verse 35, uh, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So, did Philip hear God's audible voice? Did he have this flash image of seeing himself sitting in the chariot with that guy? Or was it just an idea that popped into his head, this thought of, of going over there? It doesn't really matter. The, the point is, that the, the method doesn't matter. The point is, the Holy Spirit prompted him, and he obeyed. So, the last quality of the Holy Spirit we're going to look at this morning is he is empowering. Number five, he is empowering. Acts 1, 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Uh, the Holy Spirit empowers individuals to serve God's people and spread his kingdom. The Holy Spirit empowers individuals to serve God's people or spread his kingdom. Um, of course, with our creative God, that, that's going to happen in a huge variety of ways. Um, that empowerment happened in Old Testament times. It happened in New Testament times, it still happens today. Um, 
it, it could be a temporary power that enables you to, to serve in the, for a specific season for a specific task. Or it might be a permanent spiritual gift that you'll have, you have from the point you become a Christian to, uh, through the end of your days. Um, sometimes that gift is a God-enhanced version of a natural skill or talent, um, like leading or serving or showing hospitality. Uh, other times it's a completely, it's completely miraculous, like healing someone, speaking a language you don't know. Uh, the Holy Spirit was responsible for miraculously forming Jesus inside the womb of Mary. Um, the Bible even records the Holy Spirit teleporting Philip right after he witnessed to the guy in the chariot, which is weird and cool. Um, Acts 8, picking up the story, verse 38, verses 38 through 40 says, uh, he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through and preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So, Spirit teleported Philip. It's pretty cool. Um, I just can't imagine what the guy who came up out of the water thought when I just got baptized and then the person disappeared. But... Um, here, we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is an equal member of the Trinity. So, so this is important. The Holy Spirit is capable of doing whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to. The Holy Spirit is capable of doing whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to. Um, just a random handful of ways the Holy Spirit has empowered individuals. Um, he, he gave super strength to Samson in, in Judges 14. He gave super speed to uh, Elijah, um, and that was just for a one-time occasion. He, he outran the king's chariot back to a city. Um, he, he gave this guy expert craftsmanship to build the tabernacle, and, and like this guy, he could work with wood, he could work with gold and silver, he could cut gemstones, he could weave fabric, like the Holy Spirit gifted him with everything for overseeing the building of the tabernacle. Um, Holy Spirit uh, gave people the gift of military leadership uh, a lot of times in, in the book of Judges, um, also with Saul in, in 1 Samuel 11. Um, he gives boldness for the gospel, which is, I think, his favorite one. There's some examples of Acts 4.31, Luke 4.18, Acts 1.8. Um, he, he gives a gift of mercy, uh, discernment, teaching. Those kind of come out of the, the lists of spiritual gifts that we find in, in the New Testament. He can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. And what he wants to do what we said before is uh, to empower individuals to serve God's people or to spread the gospel. Uh, he wants to empower individuals to serve God's people or expand his kingdom. So the question is, uh, am I willing to participate with him? Am I willing to participate with the Holy Spirit, with whatever he wants to empower me to do to serve And now that I have a better picture of, of the Spirit's identity, uh, will I allow him to influence my identity? Um, God, God can use you at times. Uh, God can use anyone at times, even before they become a Christian. If, uh, but if you want him to take a permanent residence in your heart, um, empower you with some permanent combination of spiritual gifts. Um, we, we have to become born-again Christians for that to happen. And uh, the Bible gives a clear uh, response to Jesus' offer. 
Jesus uh, died, took the penalty for us, breaking God's law. We, we, everyone, I've never met someone who didn't admit that, I've never met someone who thought that they never did something wrong. All of us know that we're not perfect. And God's penalty for that is, is spiritual death, which is hell. But he offered a way for anyone to come back to him and, and be forgiven by taking the punishment in our place so his justice is still fulfilled. He asks us to respond to the offer in, in four ways. Um, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, through your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So obviously, belief is the core to that response. Without that one, none of the other ones matter. Um, yeah, belief of what Jesus did for us, his offer. Uh, he wants us to confess that he's Lord, which is basically declaring him king over my life instead of me as king over my life. Um, another part of the response is uh, in Acts 2, 37 and 38. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Um, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have to repent. We can't just believe and, okay, God, I believe. Thanks for saving me. I'll go on doing whatever I want to. No, we have to repent. We have to repent, which means stop pursuing sin and pursue God instead. instead. That's what re repent means. It doesn't mean we won't mess up. It means our aim is there. And being baptized, and, and the Bible talks about that. It talks about being immersed, being lowered underwater as your personal uh, response and obedience to Jesus' offer, and, and that done in faith, always in combination with faith. Um, if you want to do that this morning or, or hear more about that, uh, come talk with, um, well, the staff will be over on the side at the end. Um, or maybe you're, you're already a Christian. You, you've been baptized. You know that the Holy Spirit is in you. You know that maybe you've, you've felt him work in your life before, but right now it's just dry and dull, and I have no connection with him. Um, I haven't felt his presence recently. If, if we want to reconnect with the Holy Spirit, it's pretty easy. Um, he, he tells us to ask. Ask God. Pray. Um, get, spend some focused time with Him and ask. Uh, Luke 11, 13 says, If then you, this is at the end of a, a story Jesus told, If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So let me pray. God, thank you for this morning. Uh, God, we thank you for who you are and uh, your three-in-one nature. God, we thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit and how He relates to us and, and how um, He's just chosen His identity to be about um, building your church and, and uh, exposing you to the world. God, we thank you. We, we pray that you would help us connect uh, with the Holy Spirit um, in whatever ways you direct. And we pray that we would, we would listen and obey and you would reveal yourself more and more as we uh, listen to those opportunities. God, I pray if anyone here is uncertain about their uh, connection with the Holy Spirit, about their the status of their salvation, God, that you would uh, just give them boldness to come up and, and talk with someone about that and, and to seek you um, through your word, through your spirit, God. Uh, we thank you for this morning, and we pray this in Jesus' name.